to the Town Manager's Substance Abuse Advisory Committee Forum on Substance Abuse. This is a very, very important forum because as people know, uh, we are facing a problem all throughout the United States with the issue of illegal substances and overdoses. Tonight, uh, this forum is being sponsored by the Town Manager's Substance Abuse Advisory Board, and we're gonna be discussing a whole variety of topics from um, to various types of illegal substances, to treatment, to law enforcement, to general public health issues. Now the Town Manager Substance Abuse Council, our advisory board, is all a whole group of organizations all working together to try to educate the citizens of Southbridge about the dangers of these illegal substances. We feel very strongly that education is the key. I just want to briefly tell you some of the organizations involved in this organization uh, to kind of give you an idea how so many different people are working hard to uh, try to uh, make some impact on this issue. Uh, we have people from Harrington Hospital, a major organization here in town, Healthy Families, Southridge Police Department, the Family Health Center, Spectrum, WCAC Head Start and Early Head Start, the Southridge Fire Department, the Southridge uh, Health Agent, health, uh, Healthy Families, I said, Town uh, of uh, Southbridge, the Town Manager's Office, Southbridge Community Connection, and Harrington Recovery. These are all organizations that have been involved now for the last two years in trying to deal with this important issue. And I want to thank all of them for their hard work in trying to uh, do everything we can to, to pro, you know, help people stay away from the dangers of this, this particular uh, problem. I briefly want to read the mission statement of the organization so you understand what we're trying to do here. The mission statement of the advisory committee is, we believe that education is the key to reducing substance abuse. The best tool against developing an addiction is avoiding drug or alcohol use in the first place. It is clear that drug abuse affects all areas of the quality of life. It has negative influences on families, communities, and on our health. We support building a strong network of healthcare providers, education officials, community groups, town officials, and citizens to work together to educate the public, provide treatment services, and to ensure public safety. Our goal is to develop a plan that provides Southbridge with a foundation that helps reduce citizens' dependence on illegal substances and allows our community to move forward in a positive and healthy direction. I want to take one minute just to thank the Southbridge Town Council for their support of this group. Uh, they provided resources to help us uh, to utilize media and different uh, media tools to get the information out to the public, so I want to thank them for their support. Now I'm going to ask all of our panelists to, first of all, put on a red ribbon right now. And the reason I want to talk about that is because between October 23rd and October 31st, there's something called Red Ribbon Week. And it's a national organization that promotes uh, substance abuse awareness and education activities all across the country. Southbridge is part of that. And you'll see signs around town. You'll see billboard. You'll see mailers go out to parents all about trying to educate people to the dangers of substance abuse. So everybody's wearing a red ribbon. That's a symbol uh, of the event. We're asking every business leader in town, we're asking retail stores, uh, families, just to get a red ribbon again from October 23rd to 31st, wear it, and it's a great opportunity to talk to your children about this issue and educate them about the dangers of, of substance abuse. So take this as an opportunity. I know it's hard to talk to your children we're sending out a mailer to our middle school and high school student parents to tell them just how to do that. So please, when you get that mailer, use that as a way to sit down with your children and talk about this very, very important issue. Now I want to start off by introducing our panel. Uh, I'm very pleased we have a great uh, deal of experts here tonight that are all uh, very knowledgeable in their particular fields. And I'm going to start from left to right. The first person is Tina uh, Grazowski. She's the project coordinator for Central Mass tobacco-free community. Obviously here to talk about vaping and tobacco issues that everyone knows right now is a hot topic all across Massachusetts. Christina Beasley, she's part of our committee. Uh, she's from Harrington Healthcare. She's gonna be talking about opioids, illegal drugs and treatment. Uh, she's one of our treatment experts and she can help a lot in talking about how people can find treatment. We're waiting on Tara R Rivera. She's gonna be here shortly. She's a recovery coach at Recovery Centers of America, and she'll be discussing alcohol issues. Jose Dingy in the middle is our deputy police chief. Obviously, he's going to be discussing law enforcement, but he's also the chairman of our advisory committee, 
and is very, very keen on uh, doing everything we can to provide education. And I know close to his heart is the issue of children and trying to do everything he can to keep children from getting involved in this poison. Andrew Pelletier is our health agent. Andy's very involved in the vaping issue, and he's the one that has to do enforcement uh, on health issues, and his knowledge is, is critical. He's part of our committee, uh, and obviously, as it comes to public health, he's our expert. The next gentleman is Paul Norman. He's our current uh, Southbridge uh, fire chief, and he's here on a very important issue. Paul's in charge of all the medical services that come through our ambulance services here in town. Our firemen essentially are our ambulance corps, and they're the people that have to go to homes when there's an overdose and have to try to save people's lives. And I want to compliment him and our police department. They've saved many, life, life, ah, many lives as a result of uh, using Narcan to help people um, kind of reverse the symptoms of addiction. They've done a great job, but in spite of their great efforts, people are still dying, and it's his department that has to deal with that, and it's, it's got to be extremely difficult to go to a scene uh, where someone has lost their life, particularly at a young age, as a result of this, this addiction. Last but not least, Craig Dolphin. He's a person in alcoholism recovery, and I really want to thank him for coming tonight because it's always tough to talk about treatment and, and your own personal dealings with these, these problems. It's, it's, it's very difficult to overcome addiction, be it to cigarettes, be it to opioids, or be it to alcohol. It's extremely hard, and I, I really want to thank him for uh, bringing his knowledge of that area to us. Last but not least, I'm Ron Sanangelo. I'm the Southbridge Town Manager, and I'm going to play the role of the moderator tonight. I'm going to ask people, as I first introduce different people, but as you want to join the conversation, just briefly raise your hand um, so that uh, I can make sure I keep the conversation flowing. With that, uh, uh, I'm going to uh, start off on the issue of tobacco. So right off the bat, Tina is our tobacco expert. And Tina, I know you were going to come tonight and talk about various aspects of tobacco and vaping. It is a hot issue. Can you kind of give us an overview of what's going on here in Mass and give us your experience on this issue? Sure. Thanks for having me tonight. The Central Mass Tobacco-Free Community Partnership is one of eight partnerships around the state. We work on um, reducing smoking and secondhand smoke. <clears throat> we do that by working on policy. We work closely through the boards of health uh, with um, uh, health directors like Andy uh, to reduce the access to uh, tobacco products for young people. We work on smoke-free housing. We work on providing cessation resources to people and mostly and probably most important, to, we work on teen prevention. So uh, helping um, teens get educated around these topics and make sure they don't start to use um, nicotine in the first place. Yeah. yeah. So what you've been seeing in the news is the result of the tobacco industries targeting young people especially with these uh, nicotine products over the past five, six years with the new products, the new vaping products that are basically unregulated. Uh, the FDA's, DA has approved them for sale, but we don't know what's in them. So the, uh, all electronic vaping products have a, uh, a battery in them and they all have a cartridge with nicotine in them. And when the, the uh, cartridge gets heated up and you inhale the nicotine along with the other uh, substances, particularly propylene glycol, the oil, and the flavorings. So what you're hearing in the news, uh, the hospitalizations and unfortunately the deaths, are from um, you know, using these vaping products, the heated elements, and uh, we don't know yet exactly what's causing the, the, the issues. Most of them we've heard about have been through um, what they call black market uh, products. We don't like that term, black market. Um, but um, And uh, we don't know whether it's the aerosolization itself. We don't know yet whether it's the products and the chemicals that are in them uh, or the, um, you know, the combination of those things. But it's very concerning. Okay, at different times, I'm going to have some statistics up on our screen here. One of the things that you talked to me about, if you could elaborate a little bit about uh, youth, because they know that a lot of moms and dads are concerned about youth tobacco use and, and how that impacts them. I know I have some statistics up on the board, but tell us a, li a little bit about that direct impact, and I know that the deputy chief has some of the products that he wants to talk about. So tell us a little bit specifically about the youth issue and the impact. Sure. I'm glad that he brought some products with him. Um, you know, again, the tobacco industry has been targeting young people with these flavored products for the past several years. and. Uh, the most sophisticated new ones, uh, one of the a brand name called Juul, are products that 
um, deliver high doses of nicotine. Uh, Juul especially delivers uh, what's called nicotine salts. It goes to the brain really quickly. And a young person's brain is still developing, so um, it takes very little nicotine for it to get addicted in the first place. The flavors um, are really enticing to young people, and most young people don't understand that they are not water vapor. They think it's just water vapor with some flavoring in it, and they don't understand the dangers of it. So the industry has um, made these products, they're very disguisable, they're very um, easy to hide, and we've been providing a lot of education to um, schools across Massachusetts, administrators, and for parents to know what the products look like so they can identify them and to help them understand and talk to their children about the myths of these products. Chief, uh, Deputy Chief Dingy, could you explain, I know you got some of those products ahead of you, I think you got it from the school system, but you tell us a little bit about you, what you're finding in the schools, the kind of materials, and, and how parents can identify these things and, and know if their children are involved, because it, it's very easy to hide this, so tell us a little bit about that. Yes, um, these devices are very clever, let me just say the least of that, and they look fun, and that, that's part of the advertising, and it's almost like cool to have a new gadget, it's like a new iPhone, now I got a new vapor, e-cigarette, and one, things I could, one thing I could tell parents is that, you know, sometimes offer to clean your kid's room, so you can look around for these things I'm about to show you, you know, offer to clean the car out, because they might not leave the e-cigarette behind, but they might leave the cartridge, which now leads you to believe that they're using the, the product. And then you could have to talk, talk with them. Um, but I don't know if the camera could get this. Like, um, this basically is one of the products. This is an e-cigarette. You, you basically cuff it. When you, when you see kids in the corner, they bring it to their mouth, suck it, they put it down. You can't see it. You can easily conceal this in your fist and smoke it. The cartridge is right here, and it's a pretty cool-looking device. It's actually. Um, now this is more of a pen style. Same thing. You could just throw this in your pocket. You fill fill it up, and same thing. You bring it to your mouth, smoke it, vapes up. This looks more like a flash drive. Some parents might think you know their kid has a flash drive in their in their bag. But this is an e-cigarette as well. So you have to be aware of these products. These are the cartridges to some of these uh, devices. So if you see the, an empty cartridge with no liquid in your kid's room, car, book bag, they're using. So you have to be aware. Something like this, this looks like a, you probably won't, wouldn't know what it is. Maybe it's for you know, a phone charger or something, a device charger. This is actually the charger to this e-cigarette. So you find this laying around or attached to the computer, your kid's charging up his, his, his e-cigarette. So you, you need to be aware of these tools that your kid has access to so you, you know if they're using or not. So if I could do one thing tonight is educate the parents, you know, hey, offer to clean your kid's room because you might find some of the devices or even the car because uh, they didn't declare a, a ban on e-cigarettes for no reason. It's, you know, killing off our kids um, very fast. And we, we don't know what, what's going on. So I think parents need to step up and, you know, start looking for these devices in their kids' rooms, bags, et cetera. Thank Tina, you. Tina, we hear all the time now, and I hear it everywhere, that, you know, e-cigarettes are better than regular cigarettes. It's, it's going to save my life because it's... It's, they think it's risk-free or not dangerous, is what a lot of people think. You know, or, I'm going to use it, it's going to help me quit smoking. A lot of that turns out to be fallacies and just really not true. Can you elaborate about that? Does using e-cigarettes help you stop smoking? Is it a lot uh, less risk than tobacco? To kind of, let's, let's tell the parents the truth of what, what is real here, so they can understand the, the risks involved. So what we say is that um, electronic cigarettes are less harmful than combustible cigarettes, but they're not harmless. And now we've been seeing that uh, in the news that they're not harmless and, and, the, and the dangers that they've been causing. They um, produce a lot of nicotine, and um, there's no research that shows that um, electronic cigarettes are a better alternative to quitting smoking combustible cigarettes 
than FDA approved, food and drug approved uh, nicotine replacement therapy, NRT. That means you get the patch, you use the gum, lozenges, they have medication that is available by prescription from your doctor, and um, counseling. So the use of counseling and uh, nicotine replacement therapy has been proven to be uh, successful. Um, are there people who have quit smoking and using vapes now? Sure. But the problem is that they're still using electronic cigarettes or vaping because they're still addicted to nicotine. Nicotine is very, um, very addictive. I would say also that in addition for parents um, understanding what the products look like, which is really important, it may not be that their child is using, but that the child's friends might be using. And they need to develop some refusal skills from language to use to be able to say to their friend, no, uh, that's okay, I don't need to try that, if, if they're offered the use of that device. Because it, there's a lot of pressure to be cool, like um, the officer said, and to have the latest technology that's really marketed towards them with music videos and um, things that look really enticing to young people. You know, one of the issues that I'm reading a lot about is that people not only use vaping, they still smoke, and they're using vaping on top of it. So now they're using nicotine even more than when they first started. That's true too, right? That's right. And we need more research on whether the use of dual, dual using is even more harmful to the brain and to the um, body systems than just one or the other. Mm -hmm. We know that. And another question that somebody brought to my attention, a comment that I think actually it was my deputy chief. We were in an event, and he was telling me that the amount of nicotine in just one vaping incident could be more than almost almost as much as a full pack of cigarettes. Mm -hmm. So it's not necessarily that there's less nicotine. In effect, it could be more depending upon how you vape and what the material, what the type of substance is within the vaping. Is that accurate? That's right, and especially with the new Juul, which is the the brand that's very um, high tech. Each flavor pod in the Juul, that's what the um, officer's holding up and showing, each Juul pod has the equivalent of nicotine <laughs> as a pack of cigarettes. So each cigarette maybe has 25 to 30 milligrams of nicotine in it, but you're getting it much more quickly to the brain because it's a combination of, of um, what's called nicotine salts is the formulation of nicotine in the Juul. They designed it to be high tech and to get it to the brain really quickly. Now for an adult smoker, it's very satisfying because it matches the flow of brain, the flow of nicotine to the brain ac across what they call the blood-brain barrier. So it's very satisfying. But for a young adolescent uh, with a developing brain, it's putting nicotine into the brain as it grows and then it forms uh, a, a pathway very quickly of addiction. Tina, one of the interesting questions is, do you know what you're getting? These are, I don't think they're FDA approved, right? So people that are using, I guess there's a lot of different types of vaping products. So you're really not sure exactly what you're getting and there's no approval process through government that protects you what you're using. Tell us a little bit about that. Right, these are FDA approved products for sale, but that doesn't mean that they've been tested or what's on the outside of the label matches what's on the inside of the product. It could say 5% nicotine, it could say 30% nicotine, but you don't know if that's actually true. When you go to the grocery store and you uh, buy a box of, of cereal, you, you trust that the FDA has tested and um, periodically inspects that what's on the inside of the cereal box matches the description that's on the outside of the box. But that's not what anybody is doing with these products. Anybody can go online and order them, and get a permit from the Board of Health and set up a shop and sell them. You don't need uh, inspection from the FDA approved products. Mm -hmm. The other interesting point here is that people have been getting away from smoke and there's been a dramatic decline in smoke, smoking over the years. Is this starting to kind of renormalize the smoking activity where again it becomes acceptable? Uh, are we turning from where we were going away from cigarette smoking back to it? I mean, is that what's happening now in the world? We're kind of, okay, we're getting people off? Now everybody's going back on because they think it's safe. Right. Well, we certainly hope not. We've done great public health. We know how to reduce smoking rates. We've done it by raising taxes. We've done it by implementing policy at the local level through the boards of health. And we've done it by um, education and with media campaigns. And it's really concerning the number, especially of youth that are using these, um, these products through the boards of health. Um, each board in Massachusetts, there's 351, so we have a great opportunity for local control to pass youth access laws 
to limit products for young people. So uh, over 150 communities have passed the most recent uh, regulation, which is called the flavor restriction. And it limits all these flavored products, all the vaping, tobacco, chew tobacco, to an adult-only establishment, which means a vape shop or a tobacconist. And of course, we want to support community efforts to get those policies in place. And that limits the access to these products for young people. You know, our health agent right now, as everybody knows, the governor and the, I guess the governor's made a ban on vaping products for the next four months. And that's a huge impact on some stores. There's, there's been a whole slew of retail stores opening across Mass. Andy, I know that you've, you've had to try to start enforcing that, I think as of today. Hey, what is the impact on, on those local businesses in what do we say to them as we basically say you're closed? The immediate impact um, is going to vary across the type of store that it is. The ban takes effect immediately. We sent out notices to all of the retailers of vape products that they have to get it off their shelves and get it off from display and that they could no longer retail it. Um, we have two stores in town that all they do is vape shops. Um, the industry has supported us, or at least the federal government and state and local governments have not done anything to curtail this industry. So because it's never been curtailed or, or closely controlled, careers have built up around it. So unfortunately, I have two stores in, in the town of Southbridge that are going to put the stores out of business because that's all they sell. But um, some of the smaller ones, we have some authority over, the, like the Cumberland Farms, the, uh, the um, convenience stores, that their tobacco license includes the vape product. So if they choose to ignore the law, we have the power to, to take that additional revenue, not just the revenues of the vape. So um, it's going to have varying impact depending upon how much their revenues depend on the product. So are there fines involved? If you get caught now selling these kind of products, do the stores get fined? Do they lose licenses? What, what, how, what does the store do? And, and then is there, there's no penalty, I guess, against a user, right? So how, what does the store do? Do they get fined? And then what, what happens, I guess? The, the Board of Health, several years ago, chose to include vape products as a tobacco product within our youth access laws. Um, within those laws are the penalties for violation of any law regarding selling to youth or selling to anybody who it's illegal to sell to. That would be anybody for vape products right now, and they would suffer the progressive penalties that the Board of Health puts in place, starting with fines of, I believe, $100, progressing up through suspension and revocation of the tobacco license. So I'm going to kind of bounce to anyone who wants to answer this question. Uh, I think one of the key things that people want to know is how do you get help with breaking the new tobacco addiction, right? So there used to be a slew of products for cigarette smoke, and, and a lot of people look at vaping as a solution. What is the new solution? How do you get off of vaping? And is there some treatment? Well, you know, I'll take it to anyone who wants to attempt, and I'm sure, Tina, you're going to be the first out of the box. How do you, how do you get help for this issue? Well, um, for sure, nicotine addiction is the same whether it's through vaping or whether it's through <clears throat> combustible tobacco. And you want to go, anybody who's thinking that they'd like to make a quit attempt should think about going to their health care provider. And especially if you have Mass Health, you get free uh, products and free counseling if you have Mass Health with a prescription from your provider. Um, you want to make a plan to quit. Coaching from a tobacco treatment coach can really help with that. The um, great news is that uh, a couple new resources are available for teens who are addicted to vaping. So now we've had well over a year um, into two years now with young people who have been vaping, getting addicted. There's a uh, quit line now for young people. It's called mylifemyquit.org, mylifemyquit. And it's set up through as an app so young people can um, go on their phones because that's where we know young people are these days and text and get help through a tobacco treatment coach by text. There is also a um, vape um, a Massachusetts um, at mass.gov where there's, they can also text but to an app and get motivational messaging. So throughout the day they can get messages to help them uh, overcome the cravings and the withdrawal that they would have going through the school day when they can't 
uh, use the product if they're trying to get off of them. Teens are desperate now. We've heard that from teens. Their friends are, are going online to social media saying, you know, I'm, I'm desperate now. I really need to get off this. They're seeing the news. You know, they're seeing the um, negative health effects. And fortunately, My Life, My Quit is, at least in Massachusetts, um, we'll see if it can be helpful for young teens. School nurses are a resource. Um, school nurses are going to get be offered training um, at the um, at, in October to help uh, young people get off of, of vaping and, and nicotine addiction. Obviously, there's a lot of moms and dads out there, right, that are trained to first identify that their children are involved with vaping, and then secondarily, how do they help them and, and how do they get them off, or what should they? I know we, we talked about some of the tools that they can look for, but what what do you what does a parent do? They should sit down and talk to their child. How, how do you have that conversation between a mom and dad and a kid? about the dangers of vaping and, and sitting down and having an honest kind of heart to heart on it. And what do they say? Because the, parent, the kids are going to go, oh, it's less dangerous than tobacco. I mean, that's, that's kind of like the answer for everything. What, what can a parent do? Sure. Uh, well, a lot of parents have that, um, you know, perception that at least their child isn't drinking or at least their child isn't um, using marijuana. Um, but... What we have uh, is resources available on the, uh, the website called Get Outraged. We hope that people are outraged about this, uh, www.getoutraged.org. And there's um, lots of information on there for parents, for community, and for schools. There's um, language that parents can use to, to talk to their children um, in a non-judgmental way uh, to understand whether they've been using these products. Uh, how they experience it themselves, what they think um, the meaning of the addiction is for them. But the main thing is to not make it punitive, and especially for schools as well. We're trying to in encourage schools that for nicotine addiction, um, you know, teens shouldn't be getting suspended. They should be getting education and should be getting treatment in schools so that they can get help with their addiction, not be suspended and lastly, before we move on to another topic, a uh, big question is what are the actual dangers of vaping, right? So everybody knows that lung cancer is a result of cigarette smoking. What, you know, we know nicotine is a dangerous product, but what are the actual physical, and we know obviously some people are dying as a result, what are some of the actual health issues as they relate directly to vaping? What are kids or adults who are doing this, what are they in store for if they continue this, this addiction? Well, that's the big question. We're in a big pickle here. We don't know. We've been saying to everybody, we know the long-term use uh, of combustible cigarettes leads to negative health effects. There's no re refuting that. We know even secondhand smoke leads to um, negative health consequences. And we don't know the long-term effect of the vaping products because they haven't been around very long. What we do know is that in the short term, they can cause respiratory infections, pneumonias, bronchitis, and that's what you've been seeing in the news with the hospitalizations. And now, uh, you know, possible death due to the um, aerosolized um, acetate, the aerosolized benzene um, going into people's lungs. People's lungs were not meant for these uh, chemical products. Yeah. Thank you. Any other comments on the issue of tobacco or vaping before I move on to the next topic? And again, to the panelists, feel free to join in, raise your hand if you want to do. I wasn't intending to ask all the questions here, so if you have comments you want to make about something that one of the speakers says, please join in. Uh, the next topic we're going to talk about is uh, opioids and, and hard drugs, different types of drugs that uh, are out there in the public right now. And I know, Christina, uh, you're sort of our expert on, on that issue. Um, you're very involved in the treatment and stuff. So uh, Christina Beasley is with Harrington Healthcare. Christina, tell us a little bit about um, your experience in this issue um, and what you see as an impact on obviously communities all across our country, but specifically here in Southbridge. Mm -hmm. So thank you for having me. Um, mm -hmm. So I work for Harrington Healthcare System, specifically in the Recovery Services Division. And what we found is probably about five years ago, we've seen a huge shift in the types of addiction that we're walking through the door. So we were, um, our, I would say, primary drugs of choice five plus years ago, we were targeting mostly alcohol use, some opiate use, and marijuana use prior to the legalization of marijuana, of course. 
probably about five years ago was that shift where opiates started to become our primary presenting problem at the office. Um, and then we realized that the addiction was progressed much further along by the time the person came to seek treatment. So, and we attribute a lot of this to fentanyl being out there. So with fentanyl comes kind of a, a higher degree of the addiction. Folks kind of, um, their support systems kind of deteriorate a little bit quicker. Their, their addiction just kind of drops to a lower level a little bit quicker. So when they're coming in, the good thing about the opiate epidemic is that I think some of the stigma has been released. So people are coming in for treatment. So we're seeing more people coming in. There's less stigma around that. And I think they really want the help sooner. So we're seeing people get into treatment a little bit quicker. Um, but the addiction is a little bit more progressed by the time they come in. Obviously, one of the big issues is the whole issue of overdoses. So mm -hmm. I'm going to go to my fire chief on this because we've had many conversations about overdoses and, and the impact on his men and, and the women and the firefighters. Uh, chief, tell me a little bit about, and you can give me the number if you want. Uh, I actually have it here. But tell, uh, you might want to give the, you know, the actual overdoses here in Southbridge. And again, I want to really stress here that you know, opioid in overdoses in Southbridge is no different. You know, it can be from a wealthy community, a poor community. Opioids is a problem across this nation. There's a, overdoses happening all throughout our country. So you know, there's this whole stigma thing, you know, oh my God, you can't talk about this. Well, the, the great thing about Southbridge is that we are talking about this and that discussion is happening. Chief, tell us the, a little bit about the overdoses here and the impact, and you can talk about the impact of Narcan and what's going on and you, sort of the overview from your perspective of what's going on with the overdose and opi opiates issue. Oh, thank you, Ron, for uh, that. Those are great, all great points, and, and I will say definitely in agreeing with you that uh, this does hit families of all economic, um, color, race. Uh, it doesn't really matter. Uh, when someone does get uh, involved with, uh, we'll say, starting with uh, pain pills or, or prescription, prescription medications, we're seeing that a lot of these, uh, these heroin users or opioid users are, are, are had a, a past surgery or some sort of injury where a physician uh, did give them uh, some, uh, some pain medicines to uh, get through it. Um, and then they regress and they, they, they don't get better and they still have pain and they do go on to the other, other drugs that you can get off the street. Um, we do have a, a, an issue here in town. I pulled some statistics uh, up until uh, today actually. Uh, so from September 1st, 2017 to current, uh, we've responded with our ambulances um, quite a few times, but I want to break it down to a particular either opioids or heroin uh, findings. Uh, we went to uh, homes or sidewalks or streets or stores uh, in town here 81 times and, and either the person was uh, unconscious, unresponsive, uh, we were able to resuscitate them. Um, so 81 times in that, that category. Um, as, as Christina had mentioned, there are other things that, uh, that, that go with all of this. Uh, opi uh, opiate, opioids, other opioids, I should say, along to include fentanyl, which seems to be the biggest rise right now. I don't know if you find the same thing, but uh, fentanyl is, is definitely a, a heavy hitter in the, on, the, on the street that you can get. Uh, so recently, those numbers have been uh, moving up uh, pretty quick. We've had 31 instances of, the, of those. Uh, again, people are, are, are grasping at straws when they're desperate to make pain go away or to make themselves feel better. So there's other categories in regards to poly substance abuse uh, uh, scenarios along with other substances that uh, either are prescription drugs um, and, and, and items like that. So 45 uh, incidents of those with our ambulance crews bringing the patients to the hospital. In in uh, almost two year period, uh, we're experiencing 157 people that have been either in those categories, unresponsive, um, and I will go down the road. Uh, a few of these people have uh, has been deceased or, or declared um, dead at the hospital. Um, our staff uh, definitely works very hard to resuscitate these people. Um, as of right now, today, um, I have a uh, possible um, six people within the community have passed away just from either heroin or an opioid uh, product that was found in their system after the, uh, after the ME's office were, were able to uh, decide what it was that did, uh, put those people out. Um, I, I do want to say, point out the one thing. Um, Narcan, uh, the town manager has mentioned Narcan. Uh, it is readily avail available on the streets. Um, we do have several cases in regards to um, people receiving Narcan before we got there. 
Um, I can tell you a couple of other stores in town. Uh, we've had uh, reports of someone being unconscious in a store, bathroom, or in the back uh, 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 aisle, um, and people have come along and give that, given them, uh, bystanders have given them uh, Narcan to start the resuscitation process. So they, those people really have saved a life by using their, their Narcan that they have. Um, and again, with the fire department and the police department, uh, the police department gives out so many doses of Narcan prior to the arrival of the ambulance services. So we are doing great things in resuscitating these people, uh, but we're finding that when they do arrive to the hospital, they get feeling better and then they get released. Uh, finding them some sort of treatment program or scenario to get them help is, is kind of where our stumbling block is as public safety uh, personnel. So, so Chief, one of the things that, that always stuns me, someone comes close to dying, they're overdosed, they're unconscious, fire department goes there, the ambulance guys give them Narcan and come back to life. Then they do this over again. This is not a one-time deal for people that even though they came close to dying, they come back again, you're doing a second, sometimes a third treatment to keep these people alive. I think that, that really goes a long way. Maybe, Christina, you can bounce in on this. It goes a long way to tell you how strong the addiction is and how it's so hard to get off of it because you know you almost died and you're still doing the opioid, still doing the heroin. Christina, that addiction is huge, mm -hmm. and trying to break that addiction is tremendous. I know you're involved in that treatment. Tell us a little bit about the treatment and how do you stop somebody that... You know, I know hard is a good smoking. Magnify that times the thousand, right? Yeah. For an opioid addiction. How do you have any chance at all of saving these lives? So just to speak to like the cycle of the addiction yeah. first. So the addiction really, it is a physical addiction. So when we're having somebody that just goes and gets Narcan, it's kicking the opiates off of the receptors in the brain, which then causes that person to go into withdrawal. So the act of Narcaning somebody isn't a pleasant act for that person that just got the Narcan. Um, so they're coming out of a very near miss with death, but they're also feeling pretty sick. So they don't feel well when that Narcan enters their system. Um, the other thing to remember too, and we always educate our patients and staff, is that just because you Narcan somebody, you also need to call for an ambulance. This person still needs to go to the hospital because the opiate is still there, it's in the brain and it's still floating around there. Narcan's only gonna bind to the receptors for so long and then Narcan's gonna get kicked off of the receptor, it's gonna wear off and there's a good possibility depending on how much opiate is still floating around there in the brain that the opiate can reattach to those receptors and the person can overdose again without even picking up another opiate. Um, more likely to happen is that person's going to feel really terrible after getting Narcan, uh, physically terrible, and there's a high likeliness that they're going to go back out and pick back up another opiate to not feel sick again. So the chances of re-overdosing um, are pretty high right after a Narcan. So one of the things that we have started doing over at the hospital is we've received a grant from the state, and it's called a SHIFT grant. And it's to be able to initiate Suboxone right in the emergency department. So if somebody comes in and they're overdosed, if they were just Narcan, we can initiate Suboxone that same day. So they can come in, be evaluated, and start Suboxone the same day. So that way there isn't that gap of time there where the person's going to feel bad and then create them that possibility to go back out and either use again and overdose again where the cycle will just continue. So speaking of treatment, the time to really to hit is when, when it's hot. So if the client's coming in and they're saying they want treatment right now, we need to act on that right now. We can't say our first appointment is three weeks down the road. So really access to appointments is really important to us. So um, again, just speaking of like our program of recovery services, we try to do immediate access. If somebody's calling, we're verifying insurance and hopefully getting them in within 24 to 48 hours for that appointment, if not sooner, if they are able to go through our emergency department. Because we just know time is of the essence. If somebody calls and we're saying it's a month out for an appointment, that person either won't show up a month out or the motivation has kind of laxed now because they're not in that immediate crisis. So it's really getting to them immediately. Um, and as far as treatment is concerned, specifically to opiate addiction, MAT, medication-assisted treatment, is the number one treatment for opiate addiction. So that's the use of Suboxone, Methadone, or Vivitrol. The majority of clients, and, and when I say majority, I mean the vast majority, 90% or more of clients will be successful if they're on MAT. There's only about 10% of clients that would be able to just white knuckle it and get through an opiate addiction without using MAT. So we are very um, high in recommending that folks either try Suboxone, get on Methadone. If you qualify for Vivitrol, let's try that road or Naltrexone, oral Naltrexone. Um, but we're definitely always recommending MAT for clients that have an opiate addiction. 
You know, Christine, uh, uh, an important issue is, is treatment as we've been talking about. Uh, I'm now a mom and dad and I'm worried about my child who needs treatment. You know, I know that if they have an overdose, they go to the hospital, right, for emergency room treatment. But how do I, where do I bring them if I just want to get them treatment, be it inpatient or outpatient? What are some of the places? I know that you're at the hospital, but there's a variety of places. Mm -hmm. What's a person to do? I mean, they're here, mom and dad in panic mode, their child is, they found out that they're using opioids, they're high at the time, they're trying to bring, get help. What do I do? Yeah. So you're speaking about a, a tough population as well. So there's not very many <laughs> programs out there that will treat teenagers that are active substance abusers. So that's a very highly specialized field that there's not too many of them around. So the MIR program out in Worcester is our closest and best resource for child addiction services. But if you do call any of the local agencies, like for us, recovery services for us starts at age 18. That's our licensing. So our license starts adults at age 18 and over. Um, but there are other clinicians within our child and family services that specialize with some of the addiction services. They won't be able to provide the full addiction services as somebody like Mir would be able to do. Um, I can't speak to like you, Wink, but they're also a resource that we've used when we have cases that um, you know need a little bit more care than what we can do. And especially if the child is like that 16, 17 year old that we can't under our license treat. I know Spectrum is part of our group too, right? And yes. they provide methadone clinic. I'm not, yes. I'm not sure I could speak to that. So tell me a little bit about what, that that's a substitute for, I think, heroin, right? How does that, how does that work? And, and do they just go there automatically or do they got to go through a doctor? How does that work? Yep. So um, the three main uh, medications to treat opiate addiction are methadone, suboxone, and Vivitrol. So um, here locally in town, Spectrum Health, Health Center offers methadone services. Um, they have walk-in appointments, so clients can just come in. They can self-refer. They do not need to, any kind of medical note from a doctor, um, although doctors can refer their clients there as well. They will accept uh, women that are pregnant. That's also a very good option for them. Methadone is usually the number one choice medication option for pregnant females going through opiate addiction. So, yep, that's a medication. They would go and get an evaluation by a clinician and a doctor, and then at that time they would discuss dosing and, um, you know, be started on a medication over there where they would receive that medication as a daily dosing. And Andy, our health agent, um, I know you've been working on education, the billboards, that kind of thing. You know, what can we do to educate the public? I know this is obviously one thing we're doing, but from a health perspective, obviously you're concerned about the public health in general. What can we do to educate people about this issue? Some of the things that maybe the, the committee has done. Why don't you elaborate a little bit about how we avoid this, this whole situation? If we knew how to avoid this whole situation, we wouldn't be in this situation, unfortunately. Um, the best way is to get to the youth while, before they get involved, um, teach them the potential threats, dangers of the product. Um, Find out what the source, I think of some investigation, everybody's blaming the, uh, the um, prescriptions, but there are other sources out there that people have started on, peer pressure, um, just, just availability. So we're gonna find the sources. The two strongest tools in public health are education and regulation. Unfortunately, regulation will not work in this case, so we are defaulted to education and um, I think the strongest tool you're gonna find is gonna be the parent. If you can catch your kid young enough, um, teach your kid what the expectations are and hold them to those expectations. Um, at the same time, be empathetic to whatever they end up finding themselves in and try to work to get them to want to recover. I believe um, Christine said that if a person shows up, we need to act. If a person shows up and says they want help, we need to act. I think that's a clear indication that if you bring the person there, it's probably not gonna be as effective as if they want to be cured. To bring my son in when he has a problem but he doesn't wanna find the solution, um, I don't think that's gonna be nearly as effective as my son, and I say my son, I, I'm, I'm not making any indications either way right now, but um, that, that's no, it's, it, you gotta convince the people that they want the help. So, you know, we've been talking about, and I always look at this from a couple of different perspectives, right? So I look at the treatment issue, the education issue, and then I look at the law enforcement issue, right? All three of those are kind of combined. So, Chief, you know, I know we talk a lot about, you know, major drug arrests in town, going after the dealer, because I know that most of us, 
we're not after the user. We're, we want to help the user. We want to provide treatment for the user. But the, the person making the money off of this, that's, I always think of them as peddling debt. These, these, these drug dealers, these people that are, this is a business. They don't even use the product. It's their way to make millions. And if you live or die, it really doesn't matter to them. All they care about is the cash involved. So, Chief, your police department has done an extraordinary job of going after these thugs or whatever you want to call them. I don't have a lot of good names to describe them as. But tell me about the law enforcement side, what your department's doing. Uh, I know you've made numerous major arrests. Tell us about that. And, and then also explain how difficult it can be to make those arrests because of mm -hmm. the laws and how they work and sometimes benefit uh, those drug dealers that are out there. Yes. Um the drug war is very difficult. That's why it's called the drug war. Um, and our laws have made it very difficult to enforce. I would say this, that, you know, Southbridge Police Department does a great job with uh, locating drug dealers, executing a search warrant, finding the drugs. Um, unfortunately, it's like a gas station. Someone opens up again. Um, it's very difficult, you know, we, we get our tips. This is a good probably time to uh, uh, plug in our tip 411. If you wanna send anonymous tips to the Southbridge Police Department that cannot be traced back to you about drug dealing or, or any other crime, you could use our app, it's tip 411. Um, there's information on Facebook, so I won't waste much time on that, but you could just sign up for that and just send us tips anonymously, great tool. We've actually used a lot, a lot to uh, find drug dealers in town, and that's part of it. The, the, the neighborhood has to take ownership. You see traffic picking up in your neighborhood. You see suspicious activity. Say something. Call us. Do something. Because, you know, as much as you think police know everything, we might not know that's happening in your neighborhood. And it might be quite obvious, but we don't know it because... We, we, don't, we have to just pass and find out and say, oh, that looks like it's picked up. But that phone call goes a long way. That gets our detective unit investigating that home. It takes quite a bit, without getting into the law of it, to get into somebody's dwelling, their house, their castle, their palace in Massachusetts. So we do, it's not going to happen overnight. You might say, ah, I called the police department 30 days ago about this person. We know they're selling, we probably know they're selling, but it's gonna take us two or three times to uh, buy product from the house to get into the house to, to execute a search warrant. So it does take time, have patience, um, but most importantly, notify us that it's happening. Um, another thing I wanna um, just go back to the Narcan and um, the overdoses, as of today, we have done 15 invest death investigations on drug overdoses. So, you know, it's a sad day because today's one of those days that before this meeting, we were there at a drug overdose. So um, this is important why this committee gets together and it's here because it's happening. And all the tools we're mentioning, families could take advantage of that. We have what's called, when we um, go to an overdose and Narcan somebody, and I want to let everybody know the fire department does an ex excellent job. You know, we got our first responders there. We respond pretty quickly. If it's not, if it's not a police officer doing Narcan, it's a, the fire department responding. So we've saved a lot of lives in the last three years. Um, fire department started carrying Narcan way before us. We became a proactive police department back in 2015, started carrying, carrying Narcans, and we reversed a lot of deaths, you know. It started going down, but this year, for some reason, we picked up back up again. We're about at 15 death investigations related to drugs. Um, so there's tools out there. When we go to our Narcan situation, when we, somebody's an overdose, we actually try to do a, what's called a Section 35. And I, the reason I mentioned this is because it's very available to family members and uh, <laughs> friends of people suff suffering from the addiction. If you think your father's addicted, your mother's addicted, your cousin. As a family member, you have the right to go to court and petition the court for Section 35, bring the facts, say, you know, my, my significant other, I know it's heavily using, and they will get the person help. They'll actually issue a warrant to put the 
person to get evaluated for drugs. So that tool's out there, it's called the Section 35. When we respond to an overdose, we have the obvious facts that the person overdosed on drugs, so we take an, an initiative and do it ourselves. So there's a lot of tools out there, and I recommend that you even call our police department. We have the care program that we work with, uh, Harrington Hospital as well. As well. Um, you have drugs on you, you come down for help, you give us your drugs, no questions asked, no arrest. We will get you that help. We'll usually find beds that night for you with the program we have in existence. It's a care program from the Southbridge Police Department. So as a police department, we're not only looking to raid the houses and take the drug dealer down, but we know it's an addiction that needs help, and we're offering that help as a police department as well. Um, and like I said, it uh, takes a neighborhood to fight a crime, so you need to call. Call 911, let us know what's happening in your neighborhood. Use the TIP app to let us know, and hopefully that, that'll clean your neighborhood up. Chief, one of the things is that, you know, people that have been patients who, who are using painkillers, opioids, mm -hmm. uh, for a legitimate issue, uh, they might have only used five, and they got a bottle of 35 or 40. Mm -hmm. How do they get rid of that? I know that you guys have a way to deal with that. Yes. Could you explain? You have these extra pills in your house. If you don't get rid of them, your nephew, your son, your family member might look at them and either say, hey, I can make a lot of money with this by selling it, or I can use this. You don't want to have extra opioids in your house, mm -hmm. even if you're not using them because they're dangerous to others. But explain yes. what you have to do to get rid of them. Let's just say it's very important to dispose drugs properly. Um, if you don't, if you leave them sitting around, it falls into the wrong hands, it creates an overdose, it might be a child, it might be uh, you know, uh, a teenager that sells it to another f person, you know, it, it could ruin lives just leaving um, certain drugs around. So at the PD, we have a drug disposal box where you can come down and just dispose of your, any, uh, any kind of narcotics in the box, pills, prescription, and it will be taken care of. Um, no questions asked, so you can come down and dispose of your drugs in that container in the lobby of the police department. Um, with that said, we could get into the opiates, you know, when, when they give you, when you get your wisdom teeth out, they give you a prescription for 30, you only use five. You, you, then, you know, you get another pain, you start using, and that's how a lot of people get addicted, the overuse of these uh, Oxycontins or that kind of uh, medication. Um, and then that's what leads to, when they run out of the pill, it gets harder and harder to get prescriptions filled. So that, some, some people can't understand, okay, but that's a druggie, he's, get, he's using heroin, that's a whole different aspect. No, it really is not. What happens is they got addicted because they got their wisdom too foul or they got a sports injury. Now they can't get another prescription filled for pain, so they turn to the cheapest way to get a prescription filled. It's, you know, going to a street corner and buying drugs, heroin. And that's when fentanyl comes into play, and you find that person that just got their wisdom teeth out six months ago, found an addiction, goes uses drugs on the street corner, and now is dead because they used heroin from a local dealer that had fentanyl. And fentanyl is probably like 30 times stronger than uh, morphine, you know, so it's just to put in perspective. So fentanyl is a very dangerous drug. You have drug dealers cutting up drugs, heroin, with fentanyl. They're no chemist. People die. And unfortunately, so far, we have 15 deaths in Southbridge, and that's a concerning number for us. And we have to get education out there. You know, the best thing is, you know, get educated. Bring those pills down after you use the five. You don't need the 30. You never need the prescription to the fullest. Use what you need. If you don't need it, don't use it. Don't get it prescribed. Just think of your future, your kids, your family, what it could do for them if you get addicted. You know, Christina, one of the things we hear a lot, and I hear it from college students in particular, is that, hey, I only party on the weekends. You know, I only use opioids on the weekends. I'm not an addict, right? Because I only do it, you know, when I feel like doing it, and it's, you know, when I'm out with my friends on the weekend. How do you know if you're an addict? Mm -hmm. So I want to start off by saying nobody starts by saying I want to become an addict. Mm -hmm. um, addiction is a chemical process, and what ends up happening is, with opiates especially, it only takes about three days of consecutive use for somebody to become physically dependent on an opiate. So, and of course, thinking about fentanyl and, and the potency of that, it may even take less time, depending on what it's cut with. 
So addiction, a couple of the key signs that you could tell that there's an addiction or a budding addiction would be, is the person developing a tolerance? So the amount the person is using, has that increased over a certain period of time? So to put it in perspective, comparative, comparing to alcohol, which more people are a little bit more familiar with, maybe after only a couple of beers, the person was getting a buzz. Now that couple of beers doesn't do anything. Now it takes a six pack. Now it takes 10, 12, et cetera. So that's showing that there's a tolerance in that person's body. It takes more of the substance in order to get some kind of um, high from that, from that substance. Another key point would be withdrawal. So is the person experiencing any kind of withdrawal signs when they get off of the medication or the drug? So using wisdom teeth as the example, some people get on the, take the wisdom teeth out, get on Vicodin for you know, a 10-day prescription, and they notice when they get off of that prescription, they just kind of feel a little off. Maybe their stomach's a little upset, they're a little bit clammy, they're a little bit sweaty. And if this is somebody that's never had any addiction issues previously, they might ch just chalk that up to a stomach bug, just something's not right, and they don't even realize it's part of the chemical that's doing that to them. So after a couple of days, that will subside unless they continue to give into that and take more of that opiate. So withdrawal signs would definitely be a sign that there's an, a physical addiction. Um, and other topics to kind of look at which are more subjective is, is it affecting your life in any way? So can you say that you're having some kind of problems with your home life, school, work, interpersonal relationships that you can kind of go back to and say it's because of my substance use? Christine, another question comes, you know, you know if you're an overdose, they take you to the hospital, they can't say no to everybody. So everybody gets treatment. Yep. But now I have addiction problems and I have no health insurance. Mm. Where do I go? Do organizations help me? I got no money, I've got an addiction, where do I go, how am I gonna get help? Yeah, so um, through the hospital, and I'm just gonna talk about Harrington, but this can be any hospital, whatever one is closest to you, you can go right to the financial department, the credit department, and they have folks there that can help you get set up and see if you qualify for health insurance. <laughs> so um, if you were to just go pick up the Mass Health application and fill it out and mail it in, it's a very long turnaround time, sometimes up to a couple of months. If you go to the hospitals, they can just do it electronically and submit all the information for you, and you'll have it in, an answer back, usually within about three to four days, you'll know if you have health insurance coverage. And um, I would say the majority of people don't even realize that they do qualify for something. So go in, find out what you can qualify for, and get on one of the many health insurances that are out there. Lastly, the, the difficult question I know that I experienced in my family as a young kid, you have somebody in your family that has an addiction, um, and you help them, and you help them, and you help them, and you help them, and it just keeps going on and on and on and on. What are the chances of recovery for these people? I mean, I know when it comes to heroin, opioids, it's very difficult to recover. We're going to talk about that a little later when we get into alcohol. But in terms of opioid addiction, and those, those showing, can you recover? How hard is it to recover? What are the, I give, to give you an idea, what are the percentage of people that you guys treat that's stopped for some significant mm -hmm. period of time. So one thing I just want to point out is I think Andy said it really well earlier where the person has to want the help. They have to be ready for it. So um, one of the stats out there when it comes to AA meetings and NA meetings is that about 95% of people going there for the first time are going there under coercion of some sort. So somebody's making them go to that meeting. Um, does coercion work? In some cases, yes. They just need to be taken to that you know, meeting and that's where they hear their story and that's when they realize I also need this help. Um, but treatment's going to work the best when the person's ready for it. So we can't just drag a person to meetings or make, you can't force anybody to take a medication. They may or may not take it. So they have to really be ready for it. The folks that are ready for it, um, I do want to kind of preface this by saying it's a lot of work. This isn't an easy path to go down. It's not going to be, you know, sunshine and rainbows after you go get into recovery. Most people report things get worse before they get better. You know, they're dealing with damages of the past and they're really trying to repair relationships, taking care of health issues that have probably been neglected for a while. Um, so there's so many things that kind of come at them in early recovery and even more of a reason to have a good support network around you to be able to be successful with that. I think if we're talking percentages, I think it definitely varies depending on the substance and depending on what kind of treatment they go into. Um, nowadays in Massachusetts, as it is across the country, health insurance really does drive what people can do for treatment. So how long they can stay in treatment, what sorts of treatments are maybe optional 
options are available for them. And what we found is folks that can get themselves into the most intensive treatment for the longest periods of time are typically a little bit more successful because they've had a little bit of time to just work on themselves. Um, the days of 28-day programs or six-month programs has kind of gone to the wayside because insurance doesn't cover that any longer and those programs don't exist any longer. But if people can really get connected into good day treatment programs, IOPs, if they can do residential and they qualify for residential, going and really getting themselves out of the environment of the using and getting themselves around some clean and sober people um, for a little period of time is going to be their best bet. Before we switch over to the next topic of alcoholism and alcohol issues, anyone else have any comments they want to talk about on the panel as it relates to the opioids issue, be it, trips, uh, be it treatment, be it legal, be it um, the, the different types of pills, any of that stuff? What's up? Okay. With that, I'm going to move into the question of alcohol. And uh, Tara, thank you. I know you, you struggled to get in here a little bit, but I want to thank you for attending today. Tara Rivera is a recovery coach at Recovery Centers of America, and you can see uh, I threw up some of the alcohol statistics um, and some information on, on the whole issue as alcoholism. Tara, feel free to use some of it, do whatever you want. But first, why don't you kind of give us an overview of the problem, which you see on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, a general kind of sense of what, you know, how large this problem is and what's being done to address the specific problems. Yes. So Apologies about the tardiness. Thank you for having me. Um, so I, I am a recovery coach and a treatment advocate at Recovery Centers of America. Um, and I do a lot of training in the community in terms of the opioid epidemic. And I always kind of preface that by saying um, we're, you know, we talk so much about an opioid epidemic because the amount of lives that we've lost, but we're still really struggling with um, alcoholism in general. Um, in terms of numbers, we lost 72,000 people in 2017 of opioid-related deaths, but over 80,000 for alcohol-related deaths. Um, so it's still very prevalent, and I think that part of the reason we don't talk about that is because it's... Um, socially acceptable, if you will. Um, and I think that sometimes it's it's not until someone's really like in the depths of, I lost my job, I got a DUI, you know, those types of things before they actually get help. Christina talked about, um, you know, they have a, you know, three beers and they kind of get a buzz and then it works up to six beers and they kind of get a buzz. It's usually not until they're like way past that mark before they actually decide they need help and get into treatment. At Recovery Centers America, I would say 50% of our clients struggle still primarily with alcohol, and the other 50% are opioid-related deaths. So it's still a very prevalent problem um, in, in, our, in our, all of our communities. It, it seems to me in the statistics I looked at that children in particular, you know, high school level students are very, you know, their first substance often is alcohol because, as you say, it is socially acceptable. So the parents drink, it's not a big deal, there's a few bears in the refrigerator. They think it's acceptable. Tell us about the impact on children, alcohol is, and how that progresses from high school student to college student to after college. Um, so great question, and I and I do a lot of that um, education with parents and pretty much anybody who will listen. Um, our brains are not fully developed until we're around 21. Um, and so if we add alcohol or any substances that are addictive to adolescent brain, their brain can't process it the same way that ours do as an adult. Um, if a child um, drinks alcohol by the age of 15, 40% chance likely that they'll develop an alcohol problem. If they wait until the age of 21, that decreases to 7%. So, you know, when I'm talking to youth, which I do a lot in high schools, even middle schools, you know, I say, I'm, I'm not telling you don't do this. I'm telling you to please wait because your brain is really not fully developed to be able to handle the substances that you're putting into your body. You know, one of the things I've seen, uh, I've had family members involved and in, one in particular was an alcoholic, and it surprised me that I fell asleep drunk on a couch and with a cigarette, sure enough, the couch caught on fire. The house all of a sudden went on fire. She was brought to a hospital. She had the burns all over her. Went through the hospital, black soot in her nose, everything from the fire. You know, went to you know a place for a week or two, came back out and started drinking again. And it, it always kind of blows my mind to think about how strong that addiction is. Now we know it's bad with opioids, but it's no different with alcohol. Yes. alcohol that alcohol addiction is extremely strong. Mm -hmm. And even though you almost left your life, you still continue to drink. Is that, you see that on a regular basis? 
Absolutely. Um, even, you know, like Christina had mentioned, you know, it's that, it's that chemical dependency. Um, and it's, I see it day in and day out, you know, people leaving treatment and, you know, they've completed treatment with us. Usually it's anywhere from 21 to 28 days. Um, and, you know, we're feeling really good about, you know, how they're, how they progressed in treatment. You know, they were attending, um, all of their therapy and they were going to all these meetings and they were in a really good place. But, you know, when we return back home and the stressors of life come, if we don't have that support system, like Christina was talking about, whether it's a 12 step program or we're not in a, in, a, in a home where people are supportive of our recovery, it's very easy to just pick back up and do what you know is going to work and make things better, even if it's just a temporary fix. Yeah, Craig, I'm going to kind of move over to you and, and I'm going to kind of highlight this, right? So, um, you know, I've been involved in, in many years with a lot of you know, government leaders, politicians, lawyers, uh, judges, different people I've met through things. It always amazed me, you'd see them at a bar after their work day, and they'd be pounding down alcohol like, like it was soda pop. I mean, it'd be unbelievable. And these are brilliant people. They're, they're, you know, they're extremely smart. Alcohol is socially acceptable. It's, it's a nice way to sit around and talk to your buddies and friends. And the, the alcohol went down so fast, I was just, I was amazed by it. To, to the day of it, you know, I know a number of high-level professional people that are gone now today as a result of alcoholism. Uh, and it, it hurts. I mean, it hurts personally to family, to friends. It seems okay. I just went out with my buddy for a drink. And you go out there with him, and you don't realize he's an alcoholic. He keeps drinking. But you're just there for one or two drinks, and you, you really need to identify. You've had the up-close experience dealing with, with alcohol abuse and alcoholism, and you've learned from it. So kind of want you to share your experiences with us. Tell us why you're here today and why you think it's important to tell us what it looks like from the inside, from somebody who has to actually deal with this issue? Um, first and foremost, uh, everyone on the panel is fantastic, and I can't tell you how important it is that we actually get this information out in the open. Um, there is still a stigma attached to alcoholism, but alcoholism is no differently a disease than cancer is. It's actually, over time, the brain begins to, to function differently for an alcoholic. Um, in the easiest way for me to describe it is somewhere along the way, that on-off switch that everybody else has, where I can have one or two drinks at dinner and then go sit on the couch, watch the news, and then read a book. For the alcoholic, that on-off switch fails. And that one or two drinks then leads to three or four drinks, and over time will lead to drinking consistently throughout the day. Um, to the point where many alcoholics will start drinking in the morning in order to get rid of the shaking and the tremors that they have. Uh, in my case, that was definitely the progression for me personally. The disease does not discriminate. Uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, people have always uh, had this vision of um, the alcoholic as being somebody who's just on a park bench someplace uh, in the, the town or city. But the truth of the matter is that alcoholism affects every level of life and every single demographic. Uh, it doesn't discriminate in the slightest. Uh, for me personally, I'm well educated. I went through college. Um, I, I made it through grad school. I traveled around the world. Um, but I showed signs of alcoholism going all the way back to even in my high school years. Uh, when I was drinking, um, I knew that I drank a little bit differently than my peers did when we were sitting around in a gravel pit um, just having a couple pops. Uh, I was drinking for the effect of it, and um, uh, it's really a progressive disease to where when I got into college, um, I used the excuse of, you know, I'm studying a lot, and therefore I can have a couple beers before I go to bed. And that started that process of daily drinking. Um, and it is important that people understand that uh, it's also a lethal disease. Um, there are a lot of people who do die from alcohol uh, related uh, illnesses, um, you know, uh, everything under the sun from uh, organ failures to having seizures. Um, it is one of the, the um, addictions that needs medical intervention for uh, detoxification, because if not, it, it, it can be fatal. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's something that I think is really important that people know. Um, but it's also important for me to come out and talk to people about it openly, about the fact that um, there is a solution, there is an opportunity, um, and we do talk about relapse, and we do talk about how relapse can be frustrating for families, because it's also a family disease. But the truth of the matter is that we never know exactly when somebody something's going to have that moment of enlightenment where they say, yeah, I'm an alcoholic, and 
that starts the process of people becoming honest with themselves. I've seen it happen where people have come into the halls of AA saying, I just drink a little bit too much, I don't know why I'm here. And then over time, they, they hear the other stories from the other people who are their peers uh, talking openly and honestly about what it's like to be an alcoholic. And I think that's important because they begin to understand that the whole premise for uh, a peer program like that is that you can relate to your peers uh, and not necessarily compare your situation to their situation. And that's critically important. And that starts that road of recovery. Um, that support system of having someone to talk to after you get out of a, you know, a detox program, through the rehab program, into uh, a peer advising uh, role, um, or getting into a group, or getting into a church group, um, to have other individuals who know and understand what it's like to be an active alcoholic and to be actively in recovery is critically important. Um, because this is a disease that you have to keep in front of you 24 hours a day. And it is critical that people understand that relapse, while it is not um, a requirement for recovery, it is always there. It is always a possibility. And that's one of the things that I think is so important about creating these sober communities and looking into how do we actually provide more services for people when they do leave the, the support system of the hospital and the detox and the, the rehab and then get back into their home environments so that they don't fall back into old patterns. So Craig, I guess the question I have is, is, is kind of a, a tough one, right? So um, if you, being from someone who's had mm -hmm. the problem, what would have helped you the most? What did you need? Did you need a family member to be involved? Did you see yourself one day and just realize you drank too much? Did you get sick? How can someone help someone who has that alcohol addiction? What should a family member do? What, what could have somebody did that would have helped you deal with this issue quicker or faster or maybe better? Do you have any thoughts as to how that would be? Well, for family members, since it is a family disease, I do recommend the family members look into Al-Anon. Uh, Al-Anon is a great system um, because there has to be some self-care on the family side as well. And there also has to be some knowledge on the family as to what's actually happening with the person who is uh, an active alcoholic. In my case, um, I know that there was a great deal of frustration on, on my family's side. Um, I deep down inside knew I was an alcoholic, but I wasn't quite ready to make that, that commitment and to be honest with myself about the fact that I was in fact an alcoholic. And I think that um, the family support is critically important. I also think that that moment of truth, when you hit that rock bottom, uh, to have somebody there who can actually pick you up and bring you over to uh, a, a facility such as Harrington um, is also critically important. That 24-hour window, um, had it not been for my sister intervening and actually coming up and doing a wellness check on me, um, on that particular day, I had made a decision that I was going to drink myself to death. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's not something that uh, I talk about um, loosely because of the fact that it is so critically important that people understand that that is a rock bottom for a lot of people. They get to the point where they just don't want to live anymore. And to have a family member like my sister intervene, uh, and my brother and my sister-in-law as well, um, they were there at the right time in the right place. And Harrington Hospital uh, was close by because I uh, live in the area. And uh, that started my journey into recovery. Uh, but it is, a, it is work. And I will tell people honestly, it starts the first day. You have to make a decision. Do I want to live or die? You know, Tara, I, I, I've seen that kind of firsthand. I had a friend of mine who last year drank himself to death. And, it, and it, it shocks me because if you looked at this person, you're highly successful, unbelievably motivated. It's probably the person that, and I've been around a lot of intelligent people, the person I looked up to most in terms of his knowledge, his abilities and stuff. But what you see on the outside of people isn't always what's on the inside. It's the same person who, if you, if you didn't know him, you would say, oh my God, this guy is the most confident, self-unbelievable person in the world. But then if you know him and he shares with you, there's, there's a hole. Mm -hmm. There's, there's a, a, something missing inside. They may appear and they put on this image of being self-sufficient, but, but there's something missing inside and they don't feel that. And they do use alcohol or substance abuse to deal with that. Uh, and again, it, it's not a matter of how wealthy you are, how bright you are, how you are. That addiction is really hard. 
He said something a minute ago I think is critical, and I've come to that philosophy, and I don't know if it's right or not, is I believe that the faster you hit rock bottom, the better chance you are of, 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 of surviving. If, if people tend to be crutches, and they help people along and help people along, and, and not really help them stop the problem, but just carry them. They give them money, they do stupid stuff, and they let people not feel the pain for a long time. And by the time they do feel the pain, they're so addicted they can't get out. Tell me about, you know, does it make sense to, to help, not, not to help your person do better, but help them hit rock bottom to try to get them to see, as he said, the end result is often death. And people are accepting of death at the end. What is the best way? Do you hit them rock bottom? Do you carry them? I mean, families are always, they love somebody, they carry them. That's just the way it is. Tell me a little bit about that, because I think that's important for people to understand the difference between helping somebody be an addict versus helping them stop being an addict. Um, it, it is, it's, a, it's, I wish it was an easy answer. Um, you know, there's, uh, it's, it's hard to uh, know the difference between loving and supporting the person that you love that's struggling with addiction as opposed to enabling them. Um, and, and for me personally, I, I'm, I'm in recovery and both my brothers were in active addiction for 20 years and I had to watch both of them go through their own journey you know, which unfortunately included, you know, being arrested in car accidents and going to jail and all kinds of stuff. And I, when the, my phone rang, I just never knew what was going to be at the other end of that call. You know, thanks, thank God they're both in recovery today. But um, I personally had to take a, a, a stance with them that um, I love you and when you want the help, I'm here and I, I'll battle right alongside you, but I can't stand by and watch you hurt yourself. I need to emotionally for myself to protect myself back off. Um, my mother for a very long time just was always there to pick up the pieces and go grocery shopping and clean the house and pay the rent when they don't pay the rent and you know watch the kids and do all that stuff. And it really wasn't until she put her foot down with both of them and said I can't do this anymore because her own physical health had deteriorated because of her worry and fear for you know their safety they both went into treatment so I share that with people and I don't say you know there's not a one-size-fits-all there's no you know some for some it's tough love and for some you know they're like well if my mom never left my side I never would be in recovery today so I never can tell somebody this is what you need to do I think every situation is different um, but if what you're doing isn't working then maybe it's time to take a look at doing something different you know chief I, I'm going to talk specifically please chief Back in our day when we were kids, you know, kids would be out drinking. The police officers sometimes would, yeah, you know, take away your alcohol and let you go on, right? It used to be, not, they wouldn't hate with DUI or anything like that. The world has changed a lot. So God help you if you ever get caught drinking and driving these days. Tell us about that. Are you guys seeing, still seeing a lot of, you know, we call them DUIs and they have a different name for them in Massachusetts, but, but are people still drinking and driving? What's the impact of that? And, you know, we, we see the opioids, they die. But there's a lot of deaths as a result of innocent people because somebody else was drinking and driving. Tell us a little bit about what the police department sees in that respect. I think a lot of the issues are social drinking. Um, we all go, we meet somewhere, and we think we just, we, we just had two beers. Mm -hmm. We just had two drinks, and we could just drive off. And I think that's the, the major issues. A lot of people drink and drive. And let's be honest here. And we shouldn't be behind the wheel. Most of the time, you get caught is because you get in an accident or you kill somebody. And, uh, and that's the unfortunate real, realization of it. You're getting in an accident while you're drunk, then you go off to jail and you pay some hefty, hefty charges getting your license back. Um, with teenagers, is a lot, you know, you just have one, one drink in your system, 0.02 you're gonna lose your license. So um, with teenage drinking, we don't see it as much. What we're seeing now is uh, unfortunately the legalization of marijuana. People think they could smoke weed and then drive. And that's becoming a, a complex issue with law enforcement because we don't have the so-called breathalyzer to, you know, how much have you been drinking, you know? And when Massachusetts, you blow, we find out how drunk you are, you go off to jail. It's pretty simple with an OUI accident or OUI stop or we suspect alcohol. When we suspect drugs, there's a whole different ball game. We have to kind of prove that you're, un you're impaired, you're under the influence with, you know, certain behavior, the way your, your eyes act, you know, your eyes, certain tests we're trained to do. 
So it's become tougher to, uh, um, and it's become tougher to tell the kids that's, that's an illegal activity because they think it's a legalized drug now. So that, we, we're, we're dealing with that now. And, and I think if I can jump in also. Sure, the, please. With, with Today, the, Tina, with we the want vaping. you to jump in, so yeah, please. With, with the vaping of yep. marijuana now, Correct. which is, as I've, you've obviously seen, because you can use the products that you can use to vape nicotine and get liquid THC, which is the active ingredient in marijuana, and put them in the vape products. And um, young people think that it's a plant. It's not a problem for mm -hmm. them. They don't understand the tolerance level, as you were saying before. They might try a little bit, but then they need more. And um, doing something that is um, they regard as being um, less of a problem than drinking. Mm -hmm. I don't drink, but I, you know, I can use the vaping products to, to vape marijuana. Correct. And if I could add to that, is like, okay, I'm the driver. I'm not smoking, but uh, people in the back seat lit up a joint and they're smoking. And it's affecting the driver. They don't understand that the smoke, it's not like alcohol. You could go out, I'm the driver, um, I'm not drinking. When it becomes a marijuana issue, you're all smoking, in theory, if you're in the car. You're all smoking, it doesn't matter if your cigarette touches your mouth. Um, so that becomes an issue. You go, you roll up to these cars and they're full of smoke. Everyone in that car is impaired by the marijuana. And the driver thinks, I didn't smoke. I could drive off. So that's becoming quite the issue now that we have to deal with. So my fire chief, we, you know, I know you're doing the overdose and stuff. What are you seeing in terms of the ambulance calls as it relates to people that are drunk, that you know, they're, they're on the side of the street with alcohol? Are you still seeing that? I know, you know years ago when you go to hospitals, it would be literally rows of people you know, at the emergency room not being serviced, kind of sitting in the hallways just recovering. I mean, are you still seeing a lot of alcoholics that you guys are, are bringing in through the ambulances that, frankly, you know, if a real, another call comes in of a more dangerous illness, you can't respond to it because you're responding to these people that are just drunk. So what's the impact of that on your ambulance services? How, how are they distracting from many of the actual, I mean, they're all health calls, but on other medical emergencies? Well, I can say that, um, and I've worked in other cities and in, in, in areas of, of Massachusetts. Uh, Southbridge, I, I'm going to say this, is, is that we're pretty lucky here. We don't have a lot of major accidents that go through town. We have a lot of fender benders and things like that. But uh, we do have experience over the last couple of years, some uh, alcohol-related uh, traffic accidents. Um, and all, off, obviously there's been some, uh, some other recreational drug activity in regards to those, to those accidents. But I, I, again, and I can confirm with the police, uh, the deputy police chief, um, the accidents here in Southbridge are, are quite low um, on major fatality accidents. Um, so we're, we're pretty good with that. Okay. Up on the screen I have some signs of alcohol abuse and I want to have our cable guys throw it up just so that uh, people can see it because one of the hard parts here is actually identifying the problem when it comes to alcohol use because it is a publicly acceptable or socially accepted item it, it's sometimes hard to identify so i'm going to quickly go through these um, problems at work or school because of drinking if you're a kid and this goes along with any kind of substance abuse if your kid's having problem at school uh, you know skipping school hanging out with buddies not doing their work it could be because of potential drinking or, or substance abuse issues Engaging in dangerous activities such as driving while drinking, obviously something you need to talk to your children about. There's such things as contracts you can have. You can have a contract with your kid basically promising that they're not going to drive and the punishments that would be in hand if they ever do drink and drive. Uh, engaging, I'm sorry, uh, blacking out and not being able to remember what happened while you were driving or anywhere. I mean, if you black out as a result of either substance abuse or alcohol, um, and when I say substance abuse, I'm obviously talking about opioids and other kinds of things, because all of it's substance abuse. Um, if you black out, that, that tells you you have a problem. I mean, you're not supposed to black out. Uh, legal problems, if you find yourself in the police department a little often, you probably have a problem, right? Mm -hmm. So if you find yourself being involved with our police department, there's a good chance that there's significant problems and you need to deal with them. Uh, continuing to drink in spite of health problems that are made worse by alcohol. You know, people know they have liver problems and different issues and you're still drinking. Uh, that's a serious problem. And friend, when, you, when all of a sudden your friends and family are worried about you, that's probably a good sign you're in trouble. Because you know what? Friends and family are the first people to let you slide. So when they start worrying, that means they're concerned about you, right? So people need to look at these things and, and decide, uh, you know, when they should get involved. I, I'm going to say to family members, the faster you get involved, 
The more you put pressure on the person to deal with the situation, the quicker you do it, the better chance that person has not to slide down a very deep hole and the better chance of recovery uh, they can do that. Um, I have some questions up here, and I guess I want to talk about, with you, Craig, talk about treatment and where you go and what you do, and then you can add on whatever else you'd like. Yeah, as a matter of fact, I think that uh, people have to understand that um, once you get through treatment, there is life on the other side, and the life uh, gets progressively better uh, the longer your sobriety uh, period goes for, and uh, a lot of those reasons are is because you start thinking more clearly, you start engaging with your family and friends, uh, and the good friends, the friends who really care about you, not your drinking buddies. Uh, you begin to... Uh, begin to, to recognize life again, and you, you, you get back to having some really positive emotions. In my case, um, um, things started to fall into place where um, I began to, to take a job, which was uh, an entry-level position. Uh, I got promoted four times in that position. Uh, I since have been uh, moved into a position where I work for one of the local colleges, uh, doing employer relations, um, and I'm also starting my own um, kayaking program called the Serenity Outdoor School, which is to work with other uh, people in substance abuse to take them out and show them that there is a life um, in sobriety that's a good life. And it's a fun life. And uh, one of the things in the big book that I always love is one of my favorite terms is, we are not a glum lot. Uh, don't be surprised if you enter into the halls of an AA meeting and people are laughing and joking and, and having a good time. And it's, the reason for that is um, there is a, a rebirth uh, for many people uh, when they, they get into uh, a sober life and, and begin to live uh, productive lives again. And they have their families back. They're, careers back, they have opportunities uh, that they never thought that they would ever have. And so that is a very good life. The other thing is that one of the things that I want to talk about with uh, alcoholism is it's a drug, uh, it's a disease of isolation. And one of the things that has to be dealt with in sobriety is you have to break that cycle of, of isolation. And that's the reason why Smart Recovery, uh, AA, uh, church groups, um, getting involved with uh, different sober communities that might be in your area, sober living opportunities, whatever those cases may be, you need to surround yourself with other people because if not, you'll slide back into bad habits and uh, that isolationism uh, oftentimes can be very, very destructive for somebody who's living um, as a sober alcoholic. So, but there is life on the other side. It's a good life, it's exciting. There's a lot of really, really neat things that are happening. Um, and one of the conversations that I've had with some of my peers is about how do we, how do we offer these opportunities after people uh, leave um, rehabilitation at the hospital level? You know, Craig, we, we see on TV AA meetings sometimes, and I don't know how real they are into real life AA meetings, but you know, you go there and all of a sudden you have to speak in front of a group of people, I'm an alcoholic, right? And, and people, some people are scared to talk to just one person, never mind a group. You know, what is it, what is it real like going to an AA meeting and should people feel comfortable going in? Do they speak when they only want to speak? Kind of, I'm an alcoholic, I'm coming to AA, I'm scared. I never did this before. What's it like? What can I expect to happen to me? Yeah, the first uh, time I walked into an AA meeting, I was fortunate in the fact that um, I was with another person who was also in, uh, just starting their journey in recovery. Uh, but it is, um, when you walk through the door, you'll be greeted with a lot of other people who, um, our mission as alcoholics is to give back, to, to show the, the other uh, individuals who are, are new to sobriety that there is opportunity and that there are people there who care about you and support you. And so you'll find that a lot of people will come up to you, shake your hand, and hand you a telephone number and say, if you have any questions or if you want to talk, um, you know, we can sit down and have a cup of coffee afterwards. And so it's a very embracing opportunity. You do not have to speak at an AA meeting if you don't want to. Many times uh, there are different types of AA um, meetings. They're all listed on the AA website. Um, we have what we refer to as a big book meeting so that people can go through and understand a little bit more about the big book, which is, in my opinion, kind of like the Boy Scout manual that I had when I was a kid. It's there to be as a guide and to help you uh, through the recovery process. Uh, it's really your peers that are going to be there for you who are really going to help you. That's why having a sponsor who I think is better noted as a mentor 
uh, who has some length of sobriety who can walk you through. And when you're having a bad day and you pick up the phone and you call to them, they're going to say, yeah, you know something, I had something just like that happen to me, and this is what I did. And it's very comforting to know that you're not alone. Um, the other thing is that there are different styles of AA meetings. Some of them are going to be speaker meetings where you just have somebody who comes in and they just talk about their uh, strength, hope, and experience. Um, and you'll have other meetings that are kind of more discussion-based meetings. And you're going to find a group that's going to be right for you. Um, it's like anything else. Try a couple different ones. You'll get a chance to meet different people. You may find somebody that you connect with more so than other uh, people. But the key is to keep coming. And that's really the, the crux of uh, AA, is to really just be active, be a part of it, and, and embrace the journey. Tara, this one's for you. Because this one's one I always find interesting, because it, it, you know, men and women are very much alike, but sometimes they're a little bit different. And, and often I hear people who drink wine go, oh, we can't be an alcoholic if you drink wine. And, and I see that more among women, although men drink wine too, but I hear it a lot more of, of women who kind of use wine as a de-stress when they get home, right? And I've seen that on numerous occasions. Again, I don't want to say it's just a women thing because men do it too. But I find it more prevalent. I think men drinking different types of alcohol more than wine. Tell me about that. Can you not be an alcoholic if you only drink wine? And what is the impact of that? I've seen some heavily drinking of bottles of wine. Seems to me the alcoholism is, is wine related as well. Tell me about that. Well, wine is alcohol, right? So, um, you know, in the big book talks about a drug is a drug is a drug. You know, whether it's a bottle of wine, whether it's vodka, whether it's beer, um, whether it's marijuana or opiate, um, you know, they're all addictive substances. Um, and they all can lead down very um, not pleasant paths, if you will. Um, I think that, I, in general, I think people, most people find it socially acceptable, um, which is like the stigma of it. Um, and I would say, when, when you were talking earlier about the you know, warning signs of people that struggle with alcoholism or how do you know if you have a problem, um, my thought is always, tell me why you're drinking. You know, I think people that socially drink, they're like, oh, well, you know, I was at a wedding or we went out to dinner. There was like a reason for that drinking. Do you drink every night when you come home from work? Why do you drink every night when you come home from work? Um, and then, you know, if they are still not ready to admit that they have a problem, well, let's try 30 days of not drinking when you get home from work and let's see if we can find some other things that we can do for stress relief. And then we can maybe determine if maybe there is a problem there or maybe, maybe you've find something else like working out or reading a book and that's effective and you stop drinking wine, then we know maybe it wasn't a problem. But um, it is definitely, you know, it is definitely something that people um, struggle with, for sure. You know, we, we talked a little bit about stigma. And I want to talk about that because I think it's a dangerous thing. You know, back years ago when I was first being involved in this whole issue, um, you couldn't talk about drugs or alcohol in your community because if your school had drugs or alcohol in it, it was a horrible school and parents would pull out of the school. You know, um, if your family member died of you know, heroin overdose, you should be ashamed. You never would talk about it. That's starting to change. I mean, one of the things I always thought that, that carried these diseases farther, carried these addictions farther, was the fact that you couldn't talk about them. That, that people wouldn't acknowledge them, nobody would help each other because it, these problems didn't exist. I'm happy the world is changing. That's part of what we're doing here tonight, right? We're talking about this. Nobody should be ashamed because their family member died of, of heroin overdose. Or it's happening everywhere to the best families, the wealthiest families. It's not different. Don't ever be ashamed of dealing with the issue because I'm going to tell you, in my experience, everybody I know knows somebody that, that is addicted, is overdosed, so, something that is died related to Maybe it's not their, their immediate family member, but it's a cousin, uh, you know, a friend, somebody else. Talk about that stigma for a little bit. I guess, you know, I'm going to have you talk about it, and I'd like the, Christine to talk a little bit about that. Why should we talk about this issue? Why do we need to get this out to the public? Why shouldn't you be ashamed to talk to your child about it? To me, the best thing is to talk and discuss this and bring it to the forefront. So tell me a little bit about that. I think stigma is, um, you know, it's causing us to lose lives. People are not coming into treatment because they're afraid of the judgment, they're ashamed to admit what they've done, they're afraid to ask for help, they're afraid to tell somebody what they've been doing. Um, so I think the more that we talk about it and the more that we um, are approachable, 
um, I think the more that we're um, going to be able to make an impact. So having open and honest conversations, you know, I've been in recovery over 20 years and I really didn't start telling people publicly that I was in recovery until about the last five years because I started feeling like, well, you know, I am part of the stigma by not sharing my story, like as if I'm ashamed that I'm an alcoholic, I don't want to tell people that. So you're, you're seeing now a lot of people who are in, you know, 12 step programs coming out and saying, you know, I, I'm, I'm in recovery or I'm an alcoholic or, you know, I'm an addict and that's helping to break the stigma as well. And then I love hearing that, you know, police departments are doing, you know, partnership, you know, with the hospital and they're helping, um, uh, people get into recovery because there's that, you know, stigma with the law enforcement, right? They're like, oh, I can't tell the police, you know, that I'm doing this or they're going to put me in jail. Well, no, that's not what they're here for. Um, so over the past few years that I've been working in the field, I've seen this whole kind of paradigm shift taking place. And it's, you know, it's, it's amazing to see. And I'm, I'm hoping that it just continues and kind of spreads throughout other communities. Um, and people will see that they can go to the fire station, they can go to the police station, they can go to the hospital and without being, you know, uh, without having that fear of being judged and the stigma and actually get the help that they receive. So, Christine, would you like to add to that at all? Or? So that's what I was just going to say is like basically the silence is, is the problem. So the more that families are just keeping it inside the four walls of their house, it's, it, they're realizing that it's not a problem that just the family can help and solve. So getting out there, getting to a treatment provider, getting to the, the experts that know what might be the right level of care for that patient. Um, because oftentimes I think families do want to try to solve those problems internally, but this is definitely something that's bigger than most families. So uh, as a family member, as somebody that has, that's caring for somebody in addiction, you don't need to know the answers, but you just need to know where to ask for help. So just going, whether it's to the police department, just going to the hospital, talk to a primary care doctor if that's what it takes, but just knowing to ask for the help. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that I think that's critical, that that, that discussion is there, because you can't get help, and you can't solve a problem unless you identify it, right? Mm -hmm. So this identifies a problem. And I want to compliment those that, that dealt with this issue firsthand with addiction for coming out, because I think it makes you stronger. When you talk about it with other people and you realize, oh my God, it's not the end, you get family, friends, support, people recognize that you're fighting and you're strong, it gives you more strength. I think that really helps you build on, on what you're trying to do. Um, I want to thank again the, the Southbridge uh, Time Management Advisory Committee for sponsoring this. I want to give a last, the last chance for panel members to make any comments they want to before I close this out. Uh, I do want to thank each of you. This is a tremendous opportunity for people to learn, be it tobacco issue, be it you know, the harder drugs you know, or be it alcohol, they're all addictions. And they all have tremendous impact on the lives of citizens here. People are living in, in bad situations and dying as a result of this. Uh, and you guys are, are, because of the work you guys are doing, you're making an impact. And I know sometimes it's like feeling like you're a needle in a haystack. You're kind of lost in a bigger problem. But thank you for making a difference. With that, anyone have any last comments they want to make on, this, on these issues? Christina. I would just throw out there that just to keep the hope that recovery is possible mm -hmm. and that although you may feel like you're the only one struggling with it, there's a lot of people out there that have those same issues that are going through the same thing. So whether it's a recovery addiction from, you know, smoking or marijuana or whatever the substance is, that's, that's less um, of the issue, but just keeping that there is hope and that recovery is possible. So just reaching out, getting the help, getting support and advice. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure you must have some resources on your um, task force, the advisory council. Uh, you have a website for that, and you have resources. We, we have put up, uh, and frankly, at the town library, at the police department, uh, at the high school, here in town hall in the lobby. There's all kinds of information that people can come down to and get dealing with all of these issues. So the pamphlets are out there. We are right now doing a direct mailing to the parents of middle school and high school parents about how to talk to your children about these issues. There will be in October, there'll be a billboard up about the dangers of alcohol and tobacco use uh, on, on Central Street here in Southbridge. It'll be up in English for a month and in Spanish for another month. We will be promoting the Red Ribbon Campaign. We're trying to do a lot. If people need help at reaching out to Harrington Recovery, the hospital, reaching out to Spectrum, reaching out to the different groups in town, the police department, we're here to help. But the first step is the hardest, coming down and asking for help. And today I, wanna, I really want to thank all those people watching in our public access station for, for filming this show today. I want to thank uh, the people that are watching. I want to stress that 
what we're trying to do is to get you to talk about this issue. Talk to your family members if you know they have a problem. Talk to your children, identify what you can do to help them stay away from this. The, the best solution is to never get involved in the first place. God knows we know that. But if you do need help, reach out to somebody for that kind of help. I think it's critical. There's professionals all over the state that, that are working on this issue. Um, again, any other last comments before I close this up? If yeah, um, the one last comment that I'd like to make is uh, Alcoholics Anonymous uh, has really been a template for a number of other organizations who also use the 12-step uh, process. Uh, that includes uh, Narcotics Anonymous. It also includes Gambling Anonymous. Um, also, there are other programs that kind of mirror that as well. Uh, the 12-step process, um, it, it works. And um, for people who are in recovery, uh, not everybody is going to, to go through AA or uh, NA, but they are there and they're a resource. And I encourage you to check it out. Um, go to a couple meetings, even if you think that you just maybe drink too much. Um, go and, and talk to some other people and, and see where you stand. And uh, I've had a lot of people who've come through and, and, and it's been, for me personally, uh, a lifesaver. Well, again, I want to thank all of you for coming here tonight. Hopefully this message will educate people throughout Southbridge about this issue. You never know the life you might save as a result of this. Uh, could even be a friend or a family member. You don't know what your voice and what your impact will be on somebody else. And uh, I'd like to think that, that we've had some impact and that tonight will have some impact. So again, thank you all for your commitment to dealing with this issue. And thank you for attending this forum.